Hi there, welcome to Soulful Spinning, my channel about creating and using hand spun yarn. My name is Lisa and I can be found as the Soulful Spinner on Ravelry and Instagram. In today's episode, I'm going to share with you four of my recent spins. I'm going to give you some behind the scenes look at how I wash and process fleeces. And stay tuned to the end of the podcast where I show you a hand spun project I've been knitting on as well as sharing with you some of the resources that I've been finding very helpful lately. So let's get started. So the first project I wanted to talk to you about today is this Coriadale fleece. So this is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous fleece that I purchased from Elizabeth Hubbard of Hubbard Handspun. Elizabeth raises the most beautiful Coriadale and Coriadale cross fleeces. Um, this is a Coriadale with a border luster. I have another one of her fleeces. It's a white Coriadale. I think I have some right over here. Here is some of that uh, other Coriadale carted up. This is the fleece that I'm spinning when I in that uh, long draw spin, spinning video that I made recently. So that's something, but that's not part of today's episode. <laughs> so today I want to show you, talk to you about this loveliness. So I've got some footage here of uh, me opening up the raw fleece, showing you some of the raw locks, and then I walk you through how I'm washing it and processing the fleece. After that, I give you a little demonstration on how I spun a sample skein using a, a short backward draw. So I will cut away to that video right now and see you right at the end. This is a fleece from Elizabeth Hubbard, from Hubbard Hands. It's a Corydale cross with a border luster. And I wanted to just share with you um, how it looks in the raw. And I want to document how it's going to, how it's going to end up being processed. Here's the, light, the lock. So this is how I process most of my fleeces. I take my fleece and I uh, divide it into manageable chunks like this. And then I wrap it in, in a tool, in a tool material that I purchased at just my local craft shop. And I find that when I do it this way, there's a little bit of water movement within the locks and it gets a little bit cleaner that way. I also sometimes put it in a laundry bag like this so it keeps the locks contained and then uh, once it dries the lock structure is pretty much maintained. So you can see here how dirty that is. It's mostly grease. This is a coated fleece so there wasn't a lot of dirt um, but you can see all that yellow water is the lanolin from the fleece that's coming off. So I found that with a high grease fleece like this one, this is a Coriadale, which is fairly high grease, I need a very strong scouring agent. So I use Power Scour. I've also used Kookaburra Wash, but I'm really finding that this is the best thing to get rid of grease in a fleece. Over here, I'm actually rewashing a Rambo, this was a Rambolet, BFL cross of a very fine fiber and I washed this maybe two times already and it was still tacky and still greasy so I'm washing it again with some boiling water I did this yesterday and the fleece came just pristine beautifully clean I wanted to show you what this fleece looked like after just one wash with power scour I know I sound like a bit of a commercial for the product but it really is very very good so what I did is I dumped the greasy water out into the garden. I don't put it down the drain because it can't clog up your, your uh, pipe, so you want to be careful about that. And you can see this is a rinse. This is my first rinse. I did the same. What I did is I boiled some more water, and now I'm just putting the fleece back in. And you can see how by the water, it's still a little bit dirty. I'm going to give it two rinses, but really one wash and two rinses was sufficient to get this fleece uh, 
very clean and easy to process. After I've given my fleece one or two washes and a few rinses, I take it outside with an old towel. Oops, I'm in the shadow here. So I take my fleece with an old towel and I lay it out. I just kind of throw it on there. I try not to handle it too much because I don't want to felt it. But you can be surprisingly rough with your fleeces. Don't, I have not really felted anything. Um, my worst, uh, I guess, mistake in washing fleece is not using hot enough water. So uh, again, you just don't want to agitate or you know rub your fleece after you've put in the soap and the hot water. So here it is outside in an old towel. And so what I'm going to do is I just make a roll, just like you're going to hand wash a sweater. And I squeeze all of the excess water out. And I might do that a couple of times. Of course, summertime is ideal for washing fleece because it'll dry super fast outside in the sun. So, and also you have the longer days, so you have your uh, more sunshine and more warmth. So. so yeah, so that's it. So then I just take it and I lay it out. Uh, this is an old, the lounging chair. I, I do have a drying rack. But I just lay it out here and then every half hour or so I come out and I flip it over and I toss it around and uh, before you know it it's dry and ready for the combs. So here I am in my backyard and I'm looking at some drying Coriadale. So this is what the fleece looks like after it has been washed and is drying in the sun. So on a hot day like today it doesn't take very long to dry. And you can see that even though I have not separated the locks and laid them in a basket or anything, it's still maintaining its lock structure and it's still very suitable for combing. Over here I have that Rambouillet BFL, so it's a very, very fine fiber, but all the tackiness is gone after I used the power scour. So uh, I highly recommend that product if you're working with raw fleece. So this is how I'm spinning my Coriadale cross on my folding lendrum. I'm doing a short backward draw from my comb nest. I'm doing um, a technique that I saw in an interweave press video. It was a video about Margaret Stove and how she processes superfine merino she, uh, fleece and turns it into a uh, lace weight yarn. You draw back to straighten the fibers and then you slide and let the twist into your fibers. 
So we draw back and let it slide. Draw back and let it slide. Draw back and let it slide. I gotta slow down my feet here. So it's really a modified short backward, where this is a short backward, where you, you pinch, pull back, release, pinch, pull back, release, pinch, pull back, release, pinch, pull back, release. Instead of doing a pinching motion, you use a finger to tension the yarn. So in my case, I think I'm getting a semi-worsted yarn because it's from Comb Nest, and I'm keeping the fibers aligned. So this is my finished three ply of my Coriadale cross and it's 144 yards and about two ounces. So um, I believe that that is a DK to light worsted. And uh, I'm pretty pleased with how it turned out. It's um, It has that typical uh, three ply roundness and the Coriadale, which is a very elastic yarn, uh, I think with that little bit of border luster, is just giving it, let me see if I can get it into a better, better light here. It just has very nice uh, sheen. And so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to ball it up. And I have uh, written myself a swatch. I'm going to do a variety of stitches and see how it looks. This is the finished swatch. So what I did is I just cast on 30 stitches and I did some simple stockinette, some simple ribbing, a cable pattern, and then a yarn over pattern from a stitch dictionary that I have. So it's brown, so you really can't see too much of it. But I'll show you closer to the camera how, what it looks like. So it has that typical three ply stitch definition though there's a I spun it uh, from comb nest with a short backward draw as I demonstrated and it's uh, I think that if I when I make more I'm gonna go down a needle size this is a little loose but uh, it turned out really really beautiful and I think it's gonna be a great a great sweater yarn so the way I'm gonna stay consistent is I'm going to use the sample card that I had made as I was spinning the yarn. So I kept a copy of the, I kept a sample of the singles. And then this is just a two ply spin, uh, ply back sample. And then I also have a three ply sample there. So when I uh, sit on my wheel and spin some more, I'll work on my being consistent. So I hope you found that interesting. I, I'm really fascinated with how people uh, deal with their fleeces. Every time I hear a podcaster talk about a fleece, I want all the details. I want the close-up glamour shots of the locks. I want to see how they're processing the fleece. I find it really endlessly fascinating. So I hope you do too. Uh, so as you see, I have a lot of spinning I have to do uh, in order to get enough yarn to make a sweater. But I really, this is one fleece that I really want to focus on. It really deserves to be spun up into something really, really special. It's, it's really a, just a, a beautiful, beautiful animal created this. So it's one of the joys of working with raw fleece. It's just uh, the tactile experience of, you know, touching the locks and processing the fleece yourself and spinning it and then someday being able to wrap myself up in a garment made out of this. It just, it just speaks to my heart. So so yeah, so that was the first uh, spin that I wanted to share with you. All right, so I have three other spins that I've been working on, and they all are spiral plied yarns. So I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos on spinning, and I found a channel called Grace Shalom Hopkins. She has a weekly 
well, she's no longer filming, but she had a series of videos called Spin Weekly. And in those videos, she opens up a box of fiber or she demonstrates a different technique. She basically shows how she does the drum carding and then she shows how she does the spinning of the yarn. And I was just fascinated, it's just absolutely fascinating watching her work. And a little bit later in this episode, I do a little homage to Grace, Grace's work. Uh, I'll show you a, uh, a combing video where I, I you know, they say that uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So I'm totally putting it out there that I stole that from her. Okay, so I hope you enjoy that. But her, her attitude and her videos just are so inspiring. And I bought her, I just recently bought her book. It's uh, called Card. She's got a series of books available for uh, download on Etsy. And I think some of them are also you can get on hard copy. But the one that I purchased was Card because I just wanted some inspiration on how I might use my drum carter to create bats of various colors and textures. Um, I have had my drum carter for quite a while and uh, really up till now I've just used it mainly for processing naturally colored fleeces. So as you'll see here I've used them quite a bit this last couple of weeks creating some colorful bats that have been an absolute joy to spin. All right, so let me walk you through three of my spiral applied yarns that I have been working on lately. And I think I'll, I'll do it in the order in which I actually spun them. Okay, so I got a big tangle here. I'm totally not a professional in case you didn't know. <laughs> All right, so I have three skeins here, or three hanks of yarn. Put that over here. Okay, so the, I'm going to explain to, what I did with these. Uh, first I'll show you the fleece, the, uh, the yarn here. So, so this is the first uh, spiral applied yarn I ever did right here. And then this was the second one. And then this was the third one. This was really all from one inspirational bat. I actually made three small bats. So what I did uh, to prep the fiber here is I took a braid of fiber from my stash. It was a a braid of Fleece Artist BFL. You can buy Fleece Artist roving that's, that's dyed. And it really reminded me of crocus flowers. It had uh, purple and green and light and yellows. And I saw it and I thought, well, I'm gonna spin that up. I'm gonna blend it a little bit and mix it up with some fibers that I had in my stash. So I put in some mohair locks. I put in silk, I think silk, mohair locks, and some sparkle and just sort of got into a flow and put things in. I made uh, sandwich layers like, like is suggested when you're in putting, when you're adding in texture into your bats. And I will show you uh, some pictures here of what the fibers look like before and then after I carded them into bats. I carded the fiber and then I spun it into a thick uh, thick and thin single and then I decided that I would spiral ply the yarn uh, with some Tussa silk singles that I had spun on my Turkish spindles and that's exactly what I did and I'm really really pleased with the with the overall effect and the overall result of my spin here it is for this one I put in beads on the plying yarn. They call the, the thinner ply the core yarn. So if you're going to do core spinning, it's called the core yarn. And for this, I took beads and I strung beads on the singles here. I think you can see them. My husband gave me some fishing line and I painstakingly strung these beads onto the plying yarn. 
there's some pink ones, gold ones, green ones. And then as I plied, I pulled the beads up. I have no idea if that's the right way to do it or not, but I just, I just ex was experimenting. So this is really, this is really what got me the bug to, to experiment with different types of yarn. You know, this is just uh, so fun to spin. I don't, I, for this one, I'm getting myself all tangled up here. I actually spun these on my Lendrum folding wheel, which is right back here. And I didn't even use the jumbo flyer, I just used the regular flyer. And that's why I, I had to spin them on three separate bobbins, because the bobbins are quite small on the Lendrum. For my other two spins, I used my little gem. My uh, Major Craft little gem has uh, much larger bobbins, and I even bought the Wild Flyer, which is a supersized jumbo bobbin, and then the flyer has very large orifice, so your you know, textured yarn, your thicker yarns can easily go onto the bobbin. So that was really a good purchase, and I'm enjoying that quite a bit. So what do you think? I don't know what I should do with this. Um, I'm thinking that it would be lovely in a single project. If you have any suggestions on, on uses for this type of yarn, I would love to hear your suggestions in the comments below. I'd also like love to hear about your experiences with any art yarn. So, as you probably know about me already, if you've watched any of my videos, I love working with fleece right off the animal. And this is, these, these are some locks from a fleece that I purchased from one of my favorite shepherdesses. She lives in Idaho and her name is Susan Aspendale. If you're interested in a Romney or a Romney Cross fleece, I would check her out on Etsy. She's very reputable. I think her prices are very reasonable and she raises just absolutely stunning fleeces. This fleece is, uh, I think she said it was a Romney crossed with a Montedale or Columbia but it is absolutely beautiful. So I'm gonna show you what the lock, what a lock looks like here up close. So here's the raw lock. It's got the little curl on the end. And it just is a pearly white, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous fleece. I'm really liking the longer wools. They're, they're really easy to process, even if you don't have any uh, special tools like combs you can just flick the tips and spin from the lock, or you can fold the lock over your finger and spin it. Actually, this probably doesn't need any really prep at all. You can just spin it like this for a textured yarn. So here is, uh, again, here are some more of the wash locks. And uh, just beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, I, I can wax poetic about fleeces till, you know, to anyone who will listen. <laughs> Just talk, just ask my husband. <laughs> so, so yeah, she, she's, this is just so beautiful. So, um, so what I, what I did with some of her fleece, this is, her name was Honeycomb. I love getting the name of the fleece. I don't know, it's, it's, it's so portly India, I know, but <laughs> just, you know, you know, the local, you know, you have this relationship with the shepherd who raises the animal and then you get the raw fleece and you wash it. You just feel so connected uh, to, to the person, to the animal. Uh, it's just, it's just a, joy, a joyful experience. I, I encourage anybody who's interested in fiber to, to dig in and try to get a raw fleece because this really is a lot of fun. So, uh, but let me get back on track here with my, with my podcast. <laughs> so anyway, so what I did is I, I, I carted up, no, I combed. I combed, um, so I combed a bunch of nests from honeycomb, and they were sitting in a basket just waiting to be spun. And really, once you comb your nests, I find that you shouldn't let them sit around for too long, because over time, they will start to compress, and they'll still be easy to spin, but it's just a lot easier to do it right away. So comb a bunch of nests and spin them up, and comb a bunch of nests and spin them up, and so forth. So I decided to spin this yarn into a, a real, well, a, what would I consider a thick single, which I did, and then I spiral plied it with a like a metallic thread that I had in my stash. So let me just show you what the result was here. It 
it's got that characteristic long wool halo, which is kind of funny because one of my Instagram friends said that this reminded her of angel wings when she looked at it, the picture on Instagram. So I have this little extra skein that came off the bobbin. I'm thinking you could use it to wrap a gift for Christmas. Just put it around the, put it around the package. So I'm wondering what I should do with this. I know it's less than 100 yards. It's probably about 80 yards. And um, not quite sure what I'm going to do with it. I could just, I was, I'm actually, I'm going to share with you a book a little bit later. And in this book, she talks about using yarn by itself, like as an end product by itself. So you could totally use this as a cowl. Though I, I kind of think you get some funny looks by some people. <laughs> Yeah. So if you have any ideas, good. If you have any ideas, uh, one of the things I was thinking you could do with this kind of yarn is use it just as sort of the brim of a hat, or you could use it for the cuff. I'm just checking to see if I'm filming it. Or the cuff of a mitten. Just some sort of accent. Um, I just... Or just use it for decoration, like I am doing here. So I'm just, I'm admiring my handiwork from afar. So. so again, yeah, I'd love to hear your suggestions on what I might do with the yarn. So, so the fourth and final spin I wanted to share with you today is this one right here. This is some spiral plied yarn that I made on the 4th of July. So it was the in the fourth it was the fourth of July here on Independence Day in the States last week, and there was a lady on Instagram. Her name is a 1764 the 1764 Shepherdess, and she put out a challenge to to the spinners to create either a Rolag or a Bayat or do some sort of spinning that was inspired by the holiday, and it just inspired me to go to my stash and look and see what I had. So I found some deep, deep, dark merino roving, and then I took my white Coriadale, and so those were my base layers for my bat, and then I looked at assorted uh, things that I could put in my bat, so some fire stars, some sparkle, sparkly fiber. I put in some silks, mohair locks, just all different things that sort of reminded me of when you watch fireworks, you have the dark sky, and then all the fireworks are all these different colors, yellows and golds and oranges and greens. And I made this bat, which I will insert a picture here for you to look at. I took it to my little gem, I spun it on the wild flyer, and I spun it in a thick and thin fashion. And then I, so I went in my stash and I found some navy blue embroidery thread. It was a number eight embroidery thread, and that's what I used to core spin this. So I think it turned out really nice. I, I'm finding that these pops of color, the yellow and the pinks, and the greens off the navy blue background, really very effective. And somebody suggested that I might use this as fringe for a scarf, or I was thinking I could incorporate it into a into a, a shawl. I don't think I would use I would make it just out of this. Maybe I would just use a plain navy blue or some other neutral color, and then I would just use this as. Um, I would just use this as some sort of um, accent, you know, some tassels or fringe or something. So, so I'm going to insert some footage here on how I spiral plied this yarn. So this was the third spiral ply that I actually attempted, and by this time I started to get pretty good at at the technique. So I I will insert some video here on how I spiral plied my yarn. So what I'm doing here is I'm spiral plying my yarn that I spun yesterday. 
from a, a bat I made on my Clemmis and Clemmis drum carter. I used white Corydale blue merino as my base and then I used assorted silks and mohair locks and a little bit of sparkle uh, for the add-ins and this is on one of my acre works bobbins. So I have it on my Lazy Kate here and I'm using my little gem uh, spinning wheel which is here actually. Let's see. Here, right here. And I'm using um, the wild flyer that I purchased for my little gem. It's, it's, I'm, um, I'm on, I've got the super jumbo bobbin that was sent with the wild flyer, and then I've got two on order with um, uh, Acre Works bobbins. So this is my, let's see, I think this is my third time spiral plying, and I'm starting to perfect my technique a little bit. The key to spiral plying, as I understand it, is to keep your core. Now I'm using, for my core, I'm using this, I'm using this crochet cotton. It's a number eight crochet cotton. And I'm just sort of resting it on the floor there, and I'm keeping it under tension. And I actually found that if I uh, wrap it around one of my fingers, kind of like when you're knitting, you can keep the tension on that core because that's the key to getting the spiral. Uh, the other thing that I read is that you want to keep your angle between your, this is the core yarn, the crochet, crochet cotton, and this is the wrapping yarn. You want to keep it about a 30 to 45 degree angle. So if you go too far out, like 90 degrees, you're going to create a wrap, like a core spun, which I haven't actually tried yet. So I'm going to try, that's next on my list to try. So I've got my tension set pretty high, so it'll pull in. And I'm on the medium whirl, I guess, on my little gem. So what I do is I hold my core yarn taut and uh, directly uh, facing in a direct line to the orifice. And then I gently let the other yarn wrap around. And I, don't, I hardly put any tension on the spiral yarn. Now what I found is that after you get the spiral you want, if you want a little bit more a tighter ply, you can just treadle a couple of times, and then that original spiral will stay in, um, will stay in the yarn. Because I know I tend to underply; it's just one of my things I tend to do. I uh, tend to underply. So, so again, I'm going to um, hold that yarn taut and gently let the other yarn spiral around, and then. Uh, before I, I wind down, I do a couple more treadles just to give a little bit more of a, uh, a wrap so it's not too loosely plied. Like I said, I'm a, I tend to loosely, I, I'm an under spinner and an under plier, so I know that that. So I'm holding, so I'm, I'm grasping the core yarn with my hand here and I'm spinning again counterclockwise because I spun the um, this yarn with a Z twist right and then the crochet cotton is so thin it doesn't need any extra twist it's not untwisting and so I'm holding the 45 degree angle here here like this um, when I, I looked at Susan Anderson's book she's got a great book on the spinners book of yarn designs it's sitting over there she has the two held like a V like this which I I was trying and then I figured, well, if I just go vertically like this and uh, loosely let very little tension on, the, on this wrapping yarn and a little bit more tension on your core yarn and you're gonna get your spiral that you want. And it is so fun. Now you can see how noisy my wheel is. I notice with this little gem, the wooden bobbins are very, very noisy. They just make that kind of sound that's kind of irritating. So the Acre Works bobbins, on the other hand, do not do that. So that's why I really love these for my gem. I don't have any of these for my other wheel, but I really like them for the little gem. So I got that tip from Luli, from the Luli podcast. All right, so let me show you what the yarn's looking like here. colors. 
Uh, last couple things I wanted to talk to you about today is a hands-fun project that I've been working on. So I've been following Rachel Smith from the Woolen Spinning Podcast, and she really stresses the importance of knitting with your hand spun. If you're interested in uh, teaching, uh, actually, if you're interested in spinning, her videos are excellent. She has some very good teaching content videos, uh, very clear, very thorough, so I highly recommend her videos. But she's always encouraging her followers and her people to knit with their hand spun. And so I'm really, uh, I'm taking that to heart and I'm attempting to do that. So I'm using these two skeins right here, these two balls of yarn. These two uh, yarns are yarns I spun up from some Three Waters Farm BFL. And I tried to find two coordinating colorways to make this shawl here. Um, I'll just start, I'm not too far along here. This is called the Brillig. Twas Brillig and the slidey toads did gimber and guile in the wave. You know that uh, Jabberwocky poem? And that's the name of this shawl. It's called uh, Brillig. And here, here's the pattern picture. Here it is. I think it's turning out okay. Uh, one thing I, I'm noticing about my hand spun is that I tend to under spin and under. <coughs> so yeah, my fierce dog, she was, she was, somebody passed by and she had to let me know. <coughs> You're a good girl. You're all right. You're all right. Okay. Yeah. So I brought my dog to the vet today. And I found out she has Lyme disease. So at first I was, what does this mean? You know, she's, she's my, dear, my dear girl and my dear friend. But uh, Dr. Ann, the good Dr. Ann told me that um, a month of doxycycline should set her to right. So, yeah, she's usually pretty quiet. I don't know why you're barking so much. Okay, you're all right. Okay, go lay down on your pillow. Go on, go lay down. So yeah, it's just personal things. I don't know if you're interested. But anyways, yeah. this is my heavily edited podcast. Okay, go lay down now. By now she's getting used to me talking to the camera. So at first she was like, Gee, why are you talking to yourself? <laughs> That's it. You're a good girl. You're a sweet girl. So um, yeah, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot from knitting with my hand spun. As I said, I... I I'm really going to work on doing a better job documenting how I'm spinning, you know, worsted versus woolen, and just keep more of the stats on my yarn. See, I really don't remember how I spun this. So I think I did a modified long draw, which tends to be my default uh, method of spinning. And I do notice there's quite a bit of uh, fuzzing. So I think I did do a semi-woolen or a woolen type of spin, but again, I didn't make a note of what I did to spin this, so note to self, document, keep a notebook, and just keep uh, keep some records on how you're spinning. So, I'm excited about actually spinning with my, uh, I'm excited about actually knitting with my hand spun, and I'm really going to work on, on doing that in the future. So I want to close today and talk to you about a couple of resources that I've been finding very useful lately. And the first one is the Spinner's Book of Yarn Designs by Sarah Anderson. And if you're a spinner at all, I'm sure you've heard of this book. I've had this book in my library here for quite a while, and it's really just been recently that I've been getting into it. It's highly technical. She goes into a lot of very technical details on how to spin different types of yarn, all the way from singles two ply, three ply, etc. And so the section that I was resourcing or, or using is the spiral ply section. And I found this to be really useful. I would highly recommend this yarn to anybody who's interested in spinning. I'm, I'm sort of working my way through this. I've worked through the spiral yarn and she does have the beaded variation and that's where I got the idea to put those beads on that one skein. And it seems to me that spiral applying is one of the 
basic foundation skills of doing any sort of core spinning or art yarn spinning. So what I'm going to do is work through this and uh, the next thing I want to work on is uh, core spinning. Yeah, Core spinning and then I want to try tail spinning. I've got some beautiful locks that I want to spin into yarn. So stay tuned for future episodes on those two techniques. As far as inspiration, color inspiration, I found a lot of, like I said before, I found a lot of inspiration from Grace Shalom Hopkins, her card book. It's just full of beautiful photography and sort of these recipes that she gives you on how you might create your own bat. Uh, a very good sound color theory, but at the same time, trusting your instincts for, for color placement, and that sort of thing. So it gives you the freedom to, to experiment and to play. I'm really seeing that the drum carter is a canvas in which you can paint your colors on. And then the other, the last book I want to mention was this one. This one is called Hand Spun, New Spins on Traditional Techniques. And this is by Lexi Boger. I had heard an interview with Lexi Boger from the Knit Girls. She had been a teacher at one of their SSK. Um, she, they have SSK so Super Summer Knit Together retreats every summer in, I think, Nashville, Tennessee. And one year she was one of the teachers. And I just loved her philosophy, her, her creative approach to yarn making. And so I picked up her book and I'm not disappointed. So she shows exciting, uh, an exciting collection of new and innovative spinning techniques. It's a well-rounded book that covers a handful of traditional styles for the spinner to master and then turns them on their ear. So I'm about halfway through the book now. I'm reading it through and uh, finding a lot of inspiration from her, from her book. What's really neat, too, is that she has taken all the photography, all the photographs, and all the illustrations are hers. Because I've been noticing when I look at a book, I'm interested, I'm getting a little bit interested in photography. I just bought a DSLR camera. It's what I'm filming this podcast on. It's a Canon SL2. And I'm sort of getting interested in photography. And I look to see, well, who takes the pictures in these books? And it was her. She took all the pictures in this book. And then she also has hand-drawn diagrams showing the techniques, which I think was really, really neat. Like here's one, like she, extreme tail spinning. So she drew that herself. That's her, her artwork in here. So I'm just finding this book to be really inspiring. I don't know, this is not everybody's cup of tea. You know, this sort of novelty yarn, it's like, what are you gonna do with it, and sort of, that kind of thing. But just as, uh, just for, for fun, it's just so much fun. And uh, yeah, and then she's got some, also has some ideas on how you might use your yarn towards the end of the book. She's got some project ideas. I find this one to be hilarious. Look at <laughs> I don't think my husband would go for that one. <laughs> so kind of some of it's a little bit out there, but some of it is just, you know, just like here's one. You know, so wearable art. I just you know, I'm sort of oh, this one I thought was really adorable. So I don't want to give everything away in the book, but uh, I highly recommend a book. I'm sort of an artist wannabe. I mean, I, I'm one of those people that am interested in art. I took a art history classes when I was in college. I love going to the museums. We have uh, the Art Institute of Chicago that's not too far from me, but just a simple train ride there. And I've always been interested in art, artwork and color. And I, I think I'm finding spinning to be an, out, an outlet for that that creative urge that I have. It's something that's not hard to do. It's not hard to throw in a bunch of colors into a drum carter and you know, cart them up and spinning is not hard to do. And so it's really given me a nice venue to experiment with some of my, my creativity and my love for color. So I think I've gone on long enough here. Um, I'm gonna to have to pick up my son from summer school in just a little bit. I really appreciate you guys tuning in to watch my, my channel this episode. I hope you found something in, uh, in, the, in this episode of use to you. And I really appreciate all of your comments, your kind remarks. 
um, in the comments below. And if you're interested in following me, I am The Soulful Spinner on Ravelry and Instagram. I would love to hear from you. Please uh, comment below. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes of Soulful Spinning, I would welcome your ideas. So I hope you're having a great summer if you're in this hemisphere, which probably most of you are. And if you're spinning with Tour de France, I hope you're having fun. I'm spinning in spirit. I, I'm not a part of a team or following anything like that. I'm just spinning every day and enjoying the process. So I hope you are too. I hope you find a lot of time for some soulful crafting and soulful spinning. So until next time, I'm going to sign off. Take care, you guys, and be well. So it's always a good idea to have the camera on and running when you're talking to it. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm upping my energy. So, all right, am I filming? I think I'm filming. <laughs>